And hello everyone out there in Twitch land. Uh, my name is John Rotenstein and I like to answer questions on Stack Overflow. So what better way to do it than to have a stream where I get to answer questions on Stack Overflow with you. So I invite you to uh, participate. Hopefully you'll learn some things about Stack Overflow. Hopefully I'll learn some things from you about how to use AWS as well. Uh, hello Jelly CSC, good to have you on board. Um, by all means, let's make this an interactive stream. Uh, I'll be led by you. And what I'd like to do in uh, the second half today is do some live coding. Uh, it's some Lambda live coding. So I'll invite you all to be my uh, pair programming buddy as we make a stopinator. I'll explain more about that later on. Hey, Mr. Bob, good to have you back again out there in um, Seattle. Uh, where, where are you, Jelly? Where are you located? In Toronto. Excellent. So uh, thanks for joining us this evening in your case. For me, I'm transmitting from uh, Sydney, Australia, where it's Thursday already and it's 11 a.m. It's a, it's a nice day out there, starting to get a bit cold in uh, winter time, however. So uh, for the people who don't know what Stack Overflow is, uh, let's do a bit of an intro. So uh, Stack Overflow is a great website where you might often land if you are uh, searching for technical questions. And any web search will typically land you on Stack Overflow. For example, if I say, how can I terminate EC2 instance uh, each night? And if I just do a Google search on this topic, uh, oh, what do you know? I end up on some AWS documentation and uh, various things. Let's see. Oh, there it was about the fifth entry in here. There was a Stack Overflow entry, something to do with, hey, have Jenkins start and stop an EC2 instance. So a lot of people end up doing web searches, landing on Stack Overflow, and they have um, some great information there. The way Stack Overflow works is somebody can ask a question. You can even upvote a question. So over here is an indication of whether people think this is a particularly well-written question. Uh, questions are tagged to make it easy for people to find. So if you're looking for specifically a SQL question on Amazon Redshift, you can use the tags to do that. And down below, uh, people can add comments. Comments are things like questions. So um, officially, you're meant to provide answers, but if you don't have the immediate answer, maybe you want to um, ask somebody, hey, uh, what is meant by um, when you said, I want to turn off an instance, do you want to stop it, do you want to terminate? So you can ask questions via a comment. And then people can come through and they can provide answers. In this case, there are actually two answers provided on this question. Uh, one has five upvotes and this lovely tick, which means the person who asked the questions thinks it's a good question. Down below there is, they think it's a good answer. Down below here is uh, another answer. In this case, it's a deleted answer. So people can uh, delete their answers if they want. If you have enough reputation on Stack Overflow, uh, like I do, you can actually view deleted questions on there. So even though this one was deleted, I can still view it. I mentioned reputation there. What is reputation? So whenever you ask a question on Stack Overflow, uh, you get some reputation points. If people upvote you by saying that was a good question, you'll get additional points. If you answer a question, you get points and people can upvote you. And you get this little score up the top here, which is effectively your reputation on Stack Overflow. Uh, the bigger the reputation, the bigger what the community thinks. Mr. Bob, 615 reputation. I bet you can get that past 1,000 just this week. Hop on and answer some questions and uh, build it up. I've been going for a number of years out there, so don't be uh, too worried about uh, my particular reputation. I've been doing it for quite a few years now as it uh, goes up and up over there. Apparently, I'm in the top 0.02% of answerers this year. There's a whole gamification thing in Stack Overflow. And that's what makes it great. Uh, every time you answer a question and somebody gives you a tick or an upvote, you go, oh, that was really great. And it makes you want to answer even more questions. So hopefully, if you're watching me doing this, uh, you will also want to answer some Stack Overflow questions out there. So, uh, oh, here's some interesting stats from the Stack Overflow website. 50 million monthly visitors to Stack Overflow. So you'll be famous. Uh, there's time between new questions. Every 14 seconds, there's a new question. So uh, uh, and millions and millions of answers out there. So great place. Often in life, I figure out how, how can I contribute to things in life? How can I make the world a better place? And I like to think that my contributions on Stack Overflow is helping to make other people's lives a bit easier because I'm reducing the frustration that they've got to do with computing. Uh, other things I love doing is I love teaching um, uh, kids how to do um, computer programming. And there is... 
an organization called the National Computer Science Center uh, in Australia. It's probably this one here. National Computer Science School. Uh, each year I uh, am an online tutor for a National Computer Science School uh, held in Sydney. And I love helping people code, learning how to code and do all that sort of thing. So this is my way of giving back to the community, making the world a better place. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing uh, of you folks out there. <laughs> ah, hello, uh, Simon Grad, um, if I pronounce that right. Yeah, I've answered quite a few questions on Stack Overflow. If I have a look at... Um, now, not everything is tagged with Amazon Web Services, but uh, um, most things are. I have answered apparently uh, 3,900 Stack Overflow questions tagged with Amazon Web Services, and not all of them are tagged correctly. So it's highly likely I might have helped answer one of your questions. Glad I could be of service there. Uh, many people are doing this. Uh, Marcin over here, he's a fellow in Perth, answering lots of questions. Uh, I did a, an analysis recently, and I found that um, about 100 people answered the one-third of the questions. And the other two thirds are answered by a total of 1800 people. So some people just answer one question a month. Um, about 1500 people answer one question a month. And um, it's a great community effort in doing it. So I'll take you through the process of what I do when answering Stack Overflow questions. And uh, see if we can learn something uh, together. Uh, I'll also point out a few techniques that I use on Stack Overflow to, uh, to help things. I'll see if I can find one. Uh, here's a little thing I do. Uh, you'll notice that Lambda is lit up in red. Uh, I mentioned before that tags in Stack Overflow are quite important because they help people identify what the question is about. Often people won't mention in the question heading what the topic is, Sentry not logging exceptions. But if you look in the tags, you can see oh, it's about Lambda and it's about Python, etc. So um, I like to get some of these tags correct. And um, I've got a little um, Grease Monkey script or Tampa Monkey if you're using Chrome. These scripts are available in the, the link just here. If you follow my bit.ly link, I've got some scripts there. What they do is they highlight link, uh, tags that seem to be slightly incorrect. So you'll see they've tagged here AWS Lambda and Lambda. Well, AWS Lambda is for the AWS Lambda service. Lambda is a generic name for a self-referencing function within many programming languages. So here you can see the tag says, do not use for the AWS service. So I've got some handy scripts available where I merely have to open this um, script, uh, open this question, and a little background script I've got going actually removes invalid tags and replaces them with correct tags. So if I now go and refresh this page, you'll see that the Lambda tag has disappeared and it's just got this AWS Lambda tag. So that's a few of the things that I do when I go through and try to clean up Stack Overflow. Uh, Jelly, yes, I added the pop filter. I listened to myself last week and I realized I was uh, popping a bit last week. So uh, as the show goes, please give me feedback. Can you hear me? Is the sound good? Do I have to make things bigger? Um, this show is for you. So let me know if things are going good. Uh, Simon Grenade, um, don't be too worried about not being able to answer questions if you think you're inexperienced. First of all, People can always downvote your answer. And don't take that bad. Take that as meaning, oops, I did something wrong. You can always delete it, and that won't harm your reputation. But people can also add additional answers. So you might not have got the whole thing right, and other people can add an additional answer. So don't feel too bad about putting the first question out there. Hunt around a bit, see a question you might be able to answer, and, and put your first one up there. And when you get those upvotes, you'll start feeling pretty uh, happy about doing it. So. I uh, generally start the day by doing a search. I look for anything that is tagged with Amazon or AWS in the tag label. So hopefully people have tagged them correctly. And I also say where it doesn't already have an accepted answer. So instead of spending my time trying to answer a question where the person who asked the question is happy, I just say, um, don't give me any of them. Then as a matter of scanning through, uh, this shows how important it is to have a good title on your question because um, people like me who scan through it, if you don't have a good title, I won't know to answer your question. Uh, Danger, you're saying Stack Overflow doesn't like it when people delete questions. In fact, if you do it too much, they'll ban you from answering questions. So the person who asks a question can certainly delete questions. And I've seen that where somebody asks a question and in the end they discover <laughs> it was their fault, they just did something wrong. And if the question doesn't really help somebody else solve the same problem, oh, you meant answers, okay. 
Um, if a question doesn't help somebody solve a problem, they can delete their their question. And sometimes I'm in the middle of answering a question, it pops up and says this question's now been deleted. Uh, answers, you can certainly delete your own answers. If you've been downvoted and you delete a question, it's actually encouraged. So Stack Overflow has this concept of badges. It's all about gamification. It's wonderful. And uh, as you do more and more Stack Overflow, uh, you get um, a whole lot of badges here. Some of them are related to topics. For example, I have a bronze badge in Amazon Athena. I've got a gold badge in Amazon S3. So that's got to do with how many questions you have answered. So this says earn at least a thousand score for 200 wiki answers uh, oh, for, for at least 200 answers in the topic uh, of Amazon S3. So you can earn these badges. There's even a badge you can get to reward you for deleting your own answer that has been downvoted. And it's like saying you're a good community person. You're not um, too proud of yourself. You're willing to listen to people. And if they say you're wrong, you take it off and you'll get rewarded with a badge. So it's not too bad. Uh, one of my favorite badges that I'm going for at the moment is this one called Epic. And an Epic badge is rewarded to you based on reputation. So in the beginning, when you answer questions on Stack Overflow, uh, which we'll get to in a moment, um, when you answer questions on Stack Overflow, uh, you get reputation and you get points that add up each day, uh, as shown here. There is a cap of 200 reputation points you can earn in a day. So if people see some of your old questions and really like it and they upvote it, then um, you might get lots and lots of reputation based on something you did a long time ago. I'll give you an example of that. Um, e there is a person who answered a question on... Oh, I don't want jobs go away. There is a person who answered a Amazon Web Services question. If I go to the top users here, and here's a couple of people. This person um, answered in their lifetime three answers regarding Amazon Web Services, but they've got a score of over 2,000 points. So the score is not necessarily reflective of how many answers you've given. It's a reflection of how many people thought your answers are really great. So if we went, go into that person, thank you, Christian, for uh, contributing. I can say, show me their answers. And you can see here they got one answer that was voted up uh, 410 times because it gave uh, lots of people the particular answer they want. This is a really good answer. Look, it's got lots of bold text. It's got quotations. It's got links to documentation. Um, a really researched answer which deserves to get upvoted and lots of people are discussing it afterwards. So where were we? That's right. Um, there's a limit of 200 reputation a day you can get. You can earn more by answering questions and having them accepted, but if people just upvoting, there's a limit of 200 a day. But to reward you for that, you can get this badge. And this badge, you earn 200 daily reputation 50 times. So if you hit the limit of reputation, uh, they will actually give you, uh, how can I get my reputation up here? Here it is. Uh, they'll give you a badge for hitting the maximum limit a certain number of times. So if I expand my range here, uh, this line represents 200. So every time I go over that line on a particular day, I can uh, earn towards that epic badge. And I think I have one more day to get over 200 points and then I earn the epic badge. And that means I then get another badge where I have to try and get even more days, <laughs> over 200 points, but that's the life. You can see here over time, I have uh, increased my Stack Overflow contributions. I started off a little bit early on and have built it up uh, more regularly since then. So let's get to uh, answering some questions. I saw this one, uh, something about uh, Lambda and the temp directory. So before I look at it, let me uh, try and guess what they're gonna be saying. Um, AWS Lambda is our serverless compute service where you can trigger a Lambda function when something happens, such as an object gets landed in S3, um, uh, something comes in through API Gateway, some streaming data. Uh, any AWS Lambda viewers out there, do you like coding Lambda? Because we'll be doing more later today. So let me know if you enjoy Lambda. Um, you can store data on the disk that is given to your Lambda container. You can store it in the temp directory. We only provide 512 megabytes of storage when you store things in a Lambda temp directory. So this often causes trouble for people who are trying to do things like uh, create zip files that are several gigs in size. Let's have a look. They've been trying to implement AWS encryption SDK in Lambda to deal with encrypted files uploaded to S3. I can get it to work by downloading the file to the temp directory. 
decrypting the file in the same directory and uploading the decrypted file back. Okay, so they're decrypting and sending back to S3. I'm also deleting the files after the operation is completed but before exiting Lambda. This is good because your Lambda container can be reused the next time that the Lambda function gets called. And if you keep storing things in that temporary directory, it can fill up. So do remember to delete things that you don't need. Uh, Soldats, oh, you're using Lambda at Edge. Um, very interesting. Lambda at Edge is a different concept where with our CloudFront content distribution network, which has hundreds of locations around the world, we can actually run Lambda functions at the edge and it can look at the request coming through and it can do things like uh, modify the request or add some cookies, uh, rewrite the request to go to a different location, do A-B testing, very powerful thing. The limitations, however, is something like it's got to run within a couple of hundred milliseconds so it doesn't slow things down and a few more limits there on, on Lambda at Edge, but that's really great. Um, and Grenade, you're looking forward to uh, the subject, fantastic. Let's have a look. When I use uh, the file system, it's common. I have concerns around temp and its security. Should I be concerned? How exclusive is the file system when you fire up a Lambda? So I can say the Lambda container is yours. It can only be used by, um, by the Lambda container you've got and it will be destroyed at some point. No one else can use that. So let's see. Um, some people have said, Marcin, our great guy Adam Perth, has provided some references there. It's not visible to other Lambdas, that's correct. And here's somebody saying, hey, it's fairly safe to use. So uh, that looks like an excellent answer. And especially this thing is important. Keep in mind that temp is not recreated with each Lambda uh, invocation. And the great thing about that is you can, the first time a Lambda function is invoked, you could download some things, maybe some library files, put them in the temp directory, and then the next execution doesn't have to download it again, so they can run even faster. So as he said, it's a feature, not a bug. It's a great way of using things. So I'll agree with him. I'll give it that an upvote, and I can't add much more to that. Uh, Mr. Bob, uh, you've used Lambda at Edge in a toy project and built a proxy. Cool. Uh, there's an excellent answer online. His name is uh, Michael uh, SQLbot, and he just loves Lambda at Edge. He, he can program whole apps at Lambda at Edge. I don't know how he does it. Uh, how to stream a video from S3 pre-signed URL. This might be a bit more complex, but it gives me a good excuse to talk about pre-signed URLs. Let's have a look. Uh, some people have commented on here. Um, so the concept of a pre-signed URL is really, really interesting. If I was to go to an S3 bucket, let's have a bit of a play with this. Um, the thing I love about Stack Overflow, it's a great learning opportunity to love uh, to, to learn about lots of other things that are happening here. Uh, loan, uh, thank you. Yes, I, I'm very passionate about some of these things, especially when I can get them to work. And, and that's very handy sometimes to do. Let's go and uh, create a nice fresh bucket. Uh, loan R3V5, I'll name it after you. Loan, oh, it's not lover, it's loan. <laughs> Uh, bucket names do have to be lowercase, however. I'll create in the Sydney region where I am. And I'm going to create, uh, it is a private bucket, so I'm happy to leave uh, S3 access, uh, block S3 access turned on. Block S3 public access is great to avoid your bucket accidentally uh, becoming public. Okay, so I've got my bucket. Let's upload a file into the bucket. Ooh, everything's small on my screen. Uh, let me go to my demos. And I've got a cat picture. Every demo needs a cat picture. So I have my cat picture. Now, here's the interesting thing. If I click on the cat, hopefully you all know this, I get a URL that goes to it. If I click that URL, I will get access denied because the bucket is private. We love that. Um, Everything in S3 should be private by default. Excellent way of working. But if you go and you choose this open button, I can see my lovely little cat picture. Uh, aren't they cute? <laughs> Thanks, Jelly. Um, so how does it work? Uh, the answer is the URL, which I'll just copy here and show you in some bigger text. Uh, the URL has a lot of ugly stuff in it, but it basically it's providing additional information to say, hey, here is a, uh, um, some security information that says you're allowed to access this URL for a limited amount of time. Uh, let's try and generate one ourselves. I'll hop into the uh, AWS CLI. I can say AWS S3 pre 
sign. Is it pre sign? This is where the help files will always be good. Uh, pre sign, just pre sign without the hyphen. AWS S3, pre sign. S3, I get my bucket name. And I say it's cat.jpg. I can optionally provide a um, a expiry time for how long it is. Otherwise, it will default to five minutes. It then gives me this lovely URL. We'll have a look in a second. I paste that into the browser, and the cat picture successfully comes up. Let's do that again just to prove that it's it's coming up. And if we look at the URL, it consists of uh, the link to my object, which I'm trying to access. It's then got a credential that is being used to access it. So this is my access key that I used when running that AWS command. It's okay for your access key to be public. It's a bit like a username. Don't worry about that. But what it's doing is it's saying, hey, it expires after a certain amount of time. And here is our signature that is calculated based on my secret key. And don't, don't let people see your secret key, but it's okay for them to see this signature, which is calculated from the secret key. Uh, if I was to come into here and I was to try and modify the URL, just by taking uh, modifying the URL a bit, comes up and says, sorry, the signature we calculated does not match um, the values you provided. So people can't cheat and try and get around it. So that's what a uh, pre-signed um, uh, S3 URL is. So this person is trying to stream a small video file the size of the file is 23 meg. I'm using the following code to retrieve a pre-signed URL. So they're saying, I want to oh. don't know what they're doing here. They're not fetching it from AWS. Media not supported. So people are saying, hey, what's the uh, pre-signed URL look like? Uh, is it working? So it looks more like they're not actually, either they're not getting the file or media could not be loaded because it failed formatted. So don't know if it's their pre-signed URL that's having a problem, but it's their file format. I want to find a question I can answer here. I just did a refresh to see the most recent questions. It's amazing how far some of the questions on here get answered. Uh, Spring Boot, I'm not familiar with Spring Boot. AWS blocking IP and MAC address combo. That's interesting. I, I'm very familiar with AWS being able to block by IP address, uh, which you can do in security groups. I've never seen MAC addresses uh, being used. MAC addresses are those uh, key unique IDs that are assigned to your network device. Now let's see. Several days ago, AWS started blocking my ability to SSH into any of my servers I set up across multiple accounts. Well. You might think that it's AWS doing that, but it's probably a result of your configuration of your network settings, your security groups, and perhaps your own network. When I try to connect, I get a message about client loop disconnect and broken pipe. Sounding a bit like a, a networking issue. It has to be Amazon somehow. Everyone wants to blame Amazon. Uh, this made me think IP address. I can connect to my phone's hotspot. Whenever people have trouble connecting to an instance, and they're trying to troubleshoot. One of the things I always say is try it on different networks. Try it on your home, try it on your um, um, work network, your home network, and tether via your phone. And they can SSH into it from their phone. So that suggests the networking configuration is okay. Given their phone probably has a random IP address, that's all sounding good. I tried my son's IP address. I'm oh, not a Mac. He's not talking about Mac addresses. He's talking about Mac uh, the Mac computer. Mr. Bob, security groups don't have deny rules, correct? Um, he, as long as he's allowing enough to get through. So just using the home network, his computer can SSH. So he's narrowed it down to the fact that it's just his computer that has a problem. This tells me it's not the IP address. The only thing I configure is a combo of IP and MAC address. He is talking about MAC address. Um, sorry, that is not something that can be done. AWS doesn't know your MAC address. Most likely it's a problem with your MAC check the usual. So given that he can connect from another computer on his own network, he can connect from his phone. Does anyone have any ideas of what this might be? Um, it wouldn't be security groups. It wouldn't be IP address. It's sounding like it's his particular 
client trying to do it or a firewall on your com on his computer let's say that um um make sure your firewall stuff turned off what else could it be um uh, firewalls um see whether you can ssh to another computer preferably in the same subnet So this is a, a good example of a comment. It's not a definitive answer. It's asking questions and wanting to have a bit of back and forth before we can provide an answer. Uh, somebody up here has also said, try a different SSH client. I presume since he was on a Mac, he's just using the command line, not loading the correct private key. Ooh, that's, that's interesting. So if you use it on his son's Mac, he's probably got the right one. Ah, this is a good one. You can use SSH dash vvv to turn on debugging which is very handy for giving um a bit of a hint over whether it's the key or not uh, a little comment here uh, a comment you've got a few minutes you can go back in and you can edit comments that you put there um, afterwards you cannot edit a comment so uh, most welcome to go back in you might also see that i'm using various markdown formatting uh, within my uh, comments a backwards tick is a way of saying, hey, uh, put some text in a uh, proportional text there. Okay, uh, Sentry with Lambda and Python. I don't know anything about Sentry. Excite Android to S3. Let's have a look at the error, see if it's anything we can do. I'm not an Android developer. This is the thing you'll notice. Um, there is a lot of questions out there. There's a lot of services one person can't be expected to know everything about AWS. But if you see a question that you think you can answer, by all means, uh, hop in and try and do it. Up, uh, oh, somebody thinks they've, I oh know they're just saying do some more logging. Let's find one that's useful. Now, oh, here's a question with a couple of bad tags. They've got the bad Lambda tag and an RDS, a relational database service tag. I'll open that and my code will automatically fix the tags. If I refresh, those tags have been corrected. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to deploy a serverless script which can make some inserts and deletes based on a received S file in S3. The problem is when I delete query in local, in, when I delete query in local environment, everything works fine. When I deploy to serverless, only the delete query does not work. I don't know if serverless would have anything to do with this. I tried to set safe updated to zero. My, it might be a MySQL thing that's not allowing him to delete things. And connects library. I'm going to skip that one. Let's find something I can answer here. Um, amplify. Good for mobile applications. Fix that particular one. S3 bucket in Terraform. Some people have answered that one already. Define a Lambda policy and assume a role. I always love these sort of things. Now, some people have given some answers here. Ah, and he's already answered his own question. So the question was answered by Alexi. No, it was uh, asked by X8. Uh, Ramsey, so they deleted the query in Lambda function but didn't update it in AWS or something. I'm not sure of that, of that question. In fact, what I should do is leave that one up. So any of you who know how to do uh, that thing that you're welcome to answer that question for me. Um, which services do I specialize in? I uh, used to be an AWS trainer, so I'd teach people all about the cloud, and we'd start with the basics, you know, uh, EC2, S3, SQS. Uh, I love doing Lambda coding. We'll do some later today. Uh, I like uh, database, especially Redshift, so I can have endless discussions on how to optimize a Redshift database. I like that sort of thing. Um, I've also played around with some of the AI services. So if you think about uh, the many different services in AWS, the best way to know them is to play with them. So if I call up a list here, we've got, um, here we are, some of the uh, machine learning services. We've got a huge list of them here lately. So I recently did a bit of an experiment with uh, Translate and Transcribe, where I, I ran a program where you can 
talk, a little Python program. You can talk and it will listen to what you're saying. So it will transcribe your speech into uh, text. I could then shove it through Amazon Translate to convert it to a different language. And then I used Amazon Polly to speak it in a different language with the desired accent. So that was a really cute thing. Um, I've got that uh, online in one of my repositories you can go and get. Uh, do you code? Uh, yeah, I like to code. We'll do some Lambda coding a bit later, Herms. Um, hang around for that. We'll, uh, there is a question that I want to answer by writing an EC2 stopinator. So I thought it'd be some great coding to do there. So I like playing with all these different services, but I like to have a, a project that I use to, um, you know, just sitting there and saying, I want to try this service doesn't work. But if I have an idea of something I want to create, I can put it together and then present. Uh, okay, so somebody has given them a good answer here. What language do you use? I love Python. Python is a great language for scripting and writing short things in. For example, uh, this is an old script I once had for a stopinator that I want to modernize. And it's very easy in Python just to write a simple script like this using any text editor. It can get it up and running very quickly or put it into Lambda. Uh, my son is doing a university here in Australia and his introduction to computer programming, they're using C. And I used C like 35 years ago. Uh, so it's a strange language for people to learn the first time they go and program. But the interesting thing is it doesn't have a lot of nice things that Python has. Therefore, you've got to do it yourself. It doesn't have the concept of dictionaries and lists and stuff that makes it easy. So they're actually learning to do things the hard way and then they can learn a more modern language that make things, makes things better. Uh, does he want to work in video games? Uh, no, I think he's happy just to do uh, general computer programming, go out there and, and be a bit of a hacker. Um, you can do his assignments for him. Uh, the, the best way to learn computing is to code it yourself. So I will happily answer questions or point a line and say, what's that line particularly doing? Or here's how to debug something. But the best way to code is is for him to do it himself. So uh, later on, we'll be using Python. Um, Jelly, yes, the AWS CLI uses Python. It uses the Bodo 3 library. And we'll have a bit of a play with that. Okay. Oh, here we've got another generate pre-signed post. Failed to set meta tag. Oh, setting the meta when creating a pre-signed URL is a little bit difficult. So here he is calling the Boto3 uh, client generate uh, a pre-signed URL for this post. And he's saying for this particular bucket, this file, everything that comes through there gets generated as part of the signature that is used to sign the post. And he's throwing in here that it has some additional metadata in there. So let's see if that's the right way to do some metadata. Uh, please provide better documentation, just as Mark Crossing says, are AWS docs hard to read? <laughs> um, what do you know? How do we create an S3 object with metadata using Boto3 browser-based upload using post? And okay, here is somebody who is passing in the same thing. They're doing a pre-signed URL. They are passing in the fields that were defined up here, but there's no, uh, these are effectively the metadata fields. So let's compare it to what they had over here. They're saying it's the X Amazon metadata test tag. These days you have to prefix everything with X. And so that looks like the right way of doing it. And then he's got his fields there. I I don't know if it's that useful, but anyone got some ideas? Uh, I'll put a link to that one in case it's useful. Uh, what's going on here? Um, uh, C, just top Java is the most popular language. I find that hard to believe. Um, C is really good for embedded programming. A lot of Raspberry Pi type devices don't have powerful processors. They're getting better now. And so a low level programming, um, embedded programming would definitely use C. Um, but I don't see C as being a, a big topic these days. Um, even C++ with good old Barney Shustrup, um, Shustrap, how we pronounce his name, that, that's getting out of date these days. 
should I choose an API gateway license to perform sentiment analysis? Will block all public access affect the other accounts? Let's have a look at this one. There is somebody who's given an answer. Uh, so, uh, will block public access affect the access from other AWS accounts? I've got a bucket that is accessible from some people in my org. That's interesting. We'll see how he did that. Or she, Vivi. Uh, and has an access control list configuration to allow access from another account. ACL configuration. Okay, they're mixing different uh, authentication types. Um, I don't want anyone to be able to put objects with public ACLs. Okay, so they want to block people from being able to make things public. I read about block public access. You can choose to block only bucket policies. There are four options. I want to block public object ACL. But if I choose this option, it will block the access. Will it block the access from the external AWS account? Confused by the concepts of object ACL and bucket ACL. Okay. Um, none of the objects block public access will block authenticated access. That's correct. So if users are going in and they're using IAM credentials, then block public access does not apply. It only applies to things that are marked as public. I'm assuming you don't want to allow any public access, so enable the top level checkbox. Let's have a look in S3. What is that top level checkbox? The descriptions are pretty good. Uh, Lona, War Games. I certainly remember the War Games movie. Uh, well, I don't remember a lot of it. Uh, Matthew Broderick, wasn't it? And uh, when my son was looking at which university course to do for his computing subjects we went to a lecture and this lecturer gave a presentation about cyber security and he started by playing an excerpt from the war games movie and it was fantastic because um, my son's here looking on um I, first of all watching the movie was great and made a very interesting lecture but it also introduced the idea that um, security is important otherwise you could jeopardize the security of your entire country and what it showed was a nuclear attack starting and they didn't know whether or not it was true uh, you watched it again recently? Yeah, I, I should put on my uh, my learning list. We should definitely um, watch that movie before we have that cybersecurity subject. And I'd like to watch his lectures. Uh, all the lectures these days at universities are online, so I'd like to watch his cybersecurity subjects there as well. Okay, block public access on S3 buckets. Uh, let's have a look here. Uh, he mentioned the first thing, block public access to buckets and objects granted through new access control lists. So correct. Uh, he would need to turn off everything on. In fact, the way he spoke, you could just probably keep everything on. The main thing is this would not allow an object to be created with an access control list, an ACL, that would allow the object to be public. So that would uh, handle it quite nicely. And not that question, this question. So... I want to block it, but if I choose it, will it block the access from the external account? No. So the answer is, uh, if you, yeah, if you have users who are via IAM credentials. then the block public access settings will not apply. They can access with their AWS credentials. It's uh, similar to what Jarmod uh, here was saying, just clarifying that they can continue to use their own credentials. So it's quite okay to add additional information on there. Um, uh, if you think you've got something to say, you can add another answer or you can uh, add it as a comment in there. Uh, C programming. Um, Zipax, what's the difference between AWS Lambda and Firebase functions? So I'm not a Firebase person, so uh, maybe somebody else out there can answer Firebase. I do see Firebase mentioned quite a bit on Stack Overflow, but I haven't used it myself. Uh, anyone out there want to answer that? 
how to create predefined AWS tags for new clusters. I want to create EC2 clusters on the fly. My DevOps team is pretty slack in tagging these servers. Oh dear, they're typical IT people. Also, more often than not, they more often than not add tags to these clusters that do not make any sense. I've created a set of predefined tags and values in a properties file they should use and have stored an S3 bucket. My requirement is that when a developer is creating a cluster through Jenkins, this property file is read for the keys and they choose one of the values. So the question is, is this a Jenkins question or is this an AWS question? So what is his question? You should probably run deny EC2 if the tags are not present. So my requirement is when a developer is creating a cluster through Jenkins, the properties file is read for the keys and they choose one of the values in the list. So if they wrote the Jenkins job correctly, uh, it will load it in. Um, there's a whole lot of blog posts you can read about forcing tags on uh, EC2 instances. Um, how to automatically tag, policies to manage tags, uh, tagging best practices, where was that blog? Tagging enforcement while launching EC2 from Linux Academy. This should give us an example. Waiting for Linux Academy. Linux Academy is recently bought out by uh, Cloud Guru. No, it's still working. Okay, uh, so here is an example. Work up the font size. They've got these things, these sort of conditions where they can say, make sure a tag is not a star or something like that. So you can enforce all of these conditions when launching EC2 instances. So it is possible to do that. Um, yeah, Mr. Bob, you tried answering some of these questions but skipped them. Yeah, it's hard coming up with a, a good meaty question. Let's have a look what else is out here. Actually, let's start at the top and see if there's any new questions that have come through. This is live. This is live from Sydney, Australia. I'm not making up these questions. Nope, nobody's asked any new ones. Let's go to the next page. Uh, history of EC2 instance scheduled events available anywhere. 42. Yes, if you answer 42 for everything, you might not get that big a score. Um, actually, while I'm here, uh, You'll notice this little inbox and what happens is if you participate in well you answered the scheduled event question thank you very much mr bob um you're doing my job for me well it's the job of the community so uh, thank you anyway uh if you put comments on a question or answers you effectively get subscribed to that question you get notified whenever something else happens about that question so uh, here is a question that somebody asked uh previously and they were saying, how can I extract within Redshift SQL? If I've got a URL that contains a parameter such as this, how can I extract it? And they're trying to use a string to get the right characters out and all that. Uh, it was actually answered by uh, an amazing fellow on Stack Overflow called Gordon Linoff. He answers lots of SQL questions. His, his reputation is right up there. And he, he gave this really good uh, regex condition. So he said, uh, you can regex match look for the uh, submission GUID equals, and then grab the next 32 characters from it. I would never have thought of that, and then retrieve the, the first result from that. Um, so I asked in, ah, somebody else gave an answer here that didn't to me look like Redshift. I didn't want to say to them, hey, um, silly person, that's not Redshift, because I might be wrong. So I said, I don't think that's syntax for Redshift. And he said, I'm not sure about the sample code, but according to Redshift, both the subscring and char index are supported. Um, so it looks like he's got some procedural language here. Uh, Redshift has the ability to add stored procedures. So this would work in a stored procedure. Uh, it might also work in a scalar function, but it just looked a little bit strange. So that's why I just put that comment on there. I don't have to come back to it. And there was another one here. Um, 
So oh, I answered a question. <laughs> Here is a question that I answered back in June 2018, so almost two years ago. And somebody has now added a comment on it nine hours ago. This works with a slight change. So it's quite okay for people to come back to uh, answers and say, hey, the, the information is now different. I have answered questions on there saying that Lambda functions run for 30 seconds because they used to. Then they were increased to five minutes. Then they were increased to 15 minutes. So it's great when people come and, and uh, improve information out there. Uh, people can also come along and edit answers. So if I was to find a question here, which somebody has answered, uh, once you earn enough permission on Stack Overflow, uh, oh, Mr. Bob, this is yours. Uh, thank you very much for answering this question. Um, if I thought, and I won't do it, but if I thought your question could be improved in any way, I can come in here and edit. In fact, sometimes I do this. Um, you have referenced an EBS volumes documentation page, which is excellent. And sometimes I like to come in and make it more um, friendly in the link. So I hope you're not offended if I clean up some of your answers. So some people are undecided about whether it's a nice thing to go and modify somebody's answer because it's something they've created. Um, Stack Overflow is effectively a wiki. So if people are contributing and improving the quality of people's answers, I think go for it. It is also possible for the person who created this answer to go back and reject my change. So they can always undo it in there. But uh, thank you very much for answering that question in there, Mr. Bob. Um, ooh, Elastic IP address. Let's uh, see what we can talk about Elastic IP address here. So, um, cannot SSH domain not found. I changed from public IP address to an elastic IP address on an EC2 instance. Then I can't log into my server and my domain wasn't connected with my server. When I did SSH, I've taken to operation timed out. Okay. So they added elastic IP address and then they couldn't connect to their server. So my immediate thought is, well, the IP address has changed. Can you ask questions in chat? Yeah, Jay, ask questions about AWS, about Stack Overflow. I'm here for you. And soon we'll do some live coding as well. Have you updated the IP address you're connecting to since you've changed to Elastic IP? Yes, I've changed the A record. That's good. Try running dig. He hasn't given us the domain, so I can't test it myself. So the big thing to realize is when you add an Elastic IP address to your server, your EC2 instance, you lose the public IP address that is added by default. When you remove the elastic IP address, you get another random public IP address. So they often change when uh, these things come along. Um, Laravel, I see a lot of Laravel type things. I have a question related to Elasticsearch. Is there a way to enable regex? I'm not an Elasticsearch person. If you want to uh, explain your question a little bit more, maybe somebody else in the chat will be able to answer you in there that's for doing um, searching for things with regex i do know however that stack overflow their uh, architecture for the search capabilities are all built on uh, elastic search so we're very capable very fast and what's interesting is sometimes i can go in and edit questions and the search results are slightly delayed from the actual contents of the questions so it's interesting that they seem to populate elastic search on a slightly delayed schedule as it updates its indexes uh, and and the search is then updated a bit later. Uh, love and learn step functions due to work projects. So step functions is the orchestration engine for AWS Lambda functions. So you can say run this function based on the output, run that function or run that function, or maybe wait 30 minutes and go run another one. So step functions is a, a really great tool mine. So uh, good to hear you using that. Oh, Docker image in step functions. Auto clicker. Relay Amazon.com. What are they trying to do here? HTML sample S3 VPC endpoints question. Now, this question has been downvoted. I should point out the criteria for downvoting says this question does not show any research effort, it is unclear or not useful. So, a downvote might mean you've written a bad question, or it might mean it's a silly topic. And some people get upset when questions are asked on Stack Overflow that is not strictly about uh, <laughs> is it a certification exam? Oh, you're right, it's a certification exam with too many answers. Uh, that's probably why it got downvoted because people are just trying to um, do that. But 
Uh, I've actually participated in writing lots of AWS certifications. Uh, let's certifications. Uh, what AWS certifications are out there? I'll just give a brief call out for them. So if you're thinking of doing some AWS certification, the Cloud Practitioner Certification, any of you who are watching the stream and half understanding what I'm talking about, you can go out and just do that certification right now. It talks about simple things like what is the cloud? What's a region? What's an availability zone? What's a reserved instance? Uh, you can handle that quite nicely. So it's an entry level uh, certification designed to let people say, yes, I've got some competence in the cloud. You then go up to the associate level exams, the most popular one of which is Solutions Architecture. It's all about how would you design a, uh, a solution in the cloud that takes advantage of cloud architecture, things like auto scaling and multiple availability zones for high availability. Uh, these associate exams are divided by, um, uh, can you get a discount voucher for certifications? I, I occasionally get some vouchers in there. Um, yeah, um, so. I don't have any on me, but I can sometimes get some of those exams. Got my SA cert a few months ago, was practicing for the professional, can't take the exam now. Fortunately, they've figured out how to run these exams in the COVID era. They've got a proctor who will watch you as you do your exam to make sure no one's uh, giving you answers or helping you cheat. Anyway, each of these associate exams is based on a job role. So if you're a solutions architect, if you're a sysops administrator, it means you're more technical. You understand the bells and whistles, the knobs and dials of how to do things. So you might talk about performance of EBS volumes as opposed to how to architect things. And developer is all about services you will use as a developer. So your Dynamo DBs and your code commit type products. But there's a lot of overlap between all of these three exams. So uh, if you've managed to pass one such as Solutions Architect, you could almost turn around and go straight back in and do the SysOps exam because it's very similar. Or you got a discount after passing your first exam. That's a great way to uh, go back and do a few more. There's also professional level exams. These ones are hellish. They're like three hours long. They're scenario based questions. Um, the better you are at English, the better your chance of passing the exam. A little secret, if English is not your first language, you can ask for some additional time on these exams, say like an extra half hour, which makes up for the, the heavy reading component of these exams. So if you've passed the solutions architect, you could go for the professional level solutions architect that's very heavy. I like to say, make sure you've been using AWS for a year, read lots of manuals. Uh, three hours is hellish. Yeah, I've done, I did two professional exams in one day, almost back to back, and it was just awful. My biggest tip, go to the bathroom before you do the exam. And uh, we've been adding more of these specialty exams out here. Uh, security, which is sort of running across lots of services. Machine learning, which is a mystery to me. I, I can't understand all the machine learning. I like all of the data analytics and databases. I can I can handle those topics. Advanced networking covers a lot of VPC, direct connect, low level networking type technologies. Uh, I don't want to make you feel too bad about the professional, but I also want to make you feel a little bit bad about the professional. Uh, exams are not designed that somebody should just be able to walk in and get them because they've just read a They've watched a few videos on YouTube. We want to make sure that you have some practical experience of what's out there. I've been involved in writing exam questions. It's a very thorough process where uh, somebody drafts a question, lots of people review it, think about different approaches, coming up with the correct answers, the fake answers. It goes through a lot of technical review to make sure it's correct. We're not writing exams to trick people. We're validating that people have knowledge in the correct domains. So if you have the knowledge out there, you've read the manuals, you've used the services, uh, you can go and do it. But uh, it's very hard to get 100% in some of these exams. Um, best resources to read to pass the cloud practitioner exam. Um, if you have used EC2, S3, you understand the basic cloud infrastructure on AWS. We have our fancy global infrastructure page on AWS. Uh, where it talks about regions, availability zones. Uh, we just launched a couple of new regions lately. So if you understand all of that, you understand the basics of billing, things like reserved instances. In fact, it's all online. If we go into the Cloud Practitioner exam, they've got an exam guide here. And uh, the topics are yeah, Cloud Concepts. What's the value proposition? Uh, what's the different architectural principles? You know, loosely coupled systems, highly available systems, uh, designed for failure, uh, the shared responsibility security model, uh, our global infrastructure. Um, 
the pricing models. You won't be asked about a particular price, but you will be asked maybe, you know, in this situation, should I use a reserved instance, a spot instance, an on-demand instance? So if, you, if you're up to date with those things, this exam should be uh, fairly straightforward for you. So let's see this person's question that they've copied from somewhere. A company has decided to move some workloads onto AWS to create a grid environment, whatever that means, to run market analytics. I'll put a link to this question in the chat in case you want to try it yourself. The grid will consist of many similar instances spun up by a job scheduling function. Each time a large analytics workload is completed, a new VPC is deployed along with a job scheduler and grid nodes. Multiple grids could run in parallel. This question's getting harder. Grids must communicate with S3. Grids must communicate with DynamoDB. The job scheduler need only communicate with the EC2 API to start new grid nodes. I got a feeling that we've got VPC endpoints coming up. In fact, that was uh, there in the title. A key requirement is you have no access to the internet, definitely VPC endpoints, either directly or via on-premise. However, applications need to be able to seamlessly communicate to S3, DynamoDB, EC2 without the need for configuration. What is the right answer? I'll give you a moment there to see. Uh, practice exams. Yes, there's also some practice exams online. Um, if you pass the practice exam, there's a good chance that you'll also pass the real exam. Now, choose three. I should point out that the official AWS exams never have um, three answers. They'll either be choose one out of four or choose two out of five. So uh, this is not a, a good example of an AWS exam question. So they're saying choose three out of six. So let's see, they're suggesting is A, E, and F. Enable VPC endpoints. What is VPC endpoints? Let's go to the handy web page. So VPC endpoints allow you to communicate directly with an AWS service from your VPC without going via the internet. Please note that not every service is listed in here. Uh, somebody asked me the other day about AWS Glue. Uh, oh, it is in there. Um, but there was a service that was not available in here. And there's a minor difference. There's something called gateway endpoints used for S3 and DynamoDB. It's not so much for creating a bucket or for creating a table but you can do it that way it's really about storing the data directly so talking to s3 about the content talking to dynamodb about the content it's also a slightly older technology so they're called gateway endpoints the newer ones are called interface endpoints not important there's never any overlap but um oh is there a good training course for a starter course for cloud practitioner um there is a free online course you can get from our website, Free Cloud Practitioner Training AWS. Let's see if I can find it here. Cloud Practitioner Essentials. Take the digital course. Put the link to this one in the chat. And um, this is a digital training, six hours, it won't take you that long. And it goes through and teaches you uh, what you should need to know for passing the Cloud Practitioner exam. Not a guarantee, but uh, go ahead and, and give it a try. Uh, you'll probably also find some online videos that are pretty good out there. Okay, so here they're saying, enable VPC endpoints for S3 and DynamoDB, because they need to talk to S3 and DynamoDB. Sounds reasonable. E, enable an interface endpoint for EC2. Interface endpoint, correct. EC2, there is an interface endpoint for EC2, which isn't for talking to the instances themselves. It's about the control plane, launching the EC2 instance, etc. And uh, F, configure S3 endpoint policy to permit access only from the grid nodes. So that's the requirement here that says... they want to block it so s3 is only available via that thing uh, s3 endpoint policy permit access only from the grid nodes so on the vpc endpoint you can put a policy that says which instances can communicate via there so that looks okay-ish um let's have a look at the answers that are not correct a private dns support name that's that's rubbish um, so private DNS name support is when you want to have Route 53 working with a private VPC and have name resolution within your VPC. 
C, configure the application of the grid applications to use the private DNS name. So they're trying to make you choose B and C together. But that doesn't matter. Uh, the private DNS name of the Amazon S3 endpoint, no, it's automatically configured for you. And D, populate the on-premise DNS, the private IP of the endpoint. So I'd say their answers are correct. Uh, I'm only going to put a, a comment. Oops. If in doubt, try it yourself. This is what I find. Uh, often people say I'm having trouble doing something and I just go and, and try and code it up myself and see uh, what comes out of there. So uh, I'm not going to provide an answer to that one. I'll just put my comments on that. Anything else here before we do some live coding? You've been hanging around wanting me to do some live coding. I've used AWS in small projects in the past, but I feel like a corporate project is another level in terms of complexity. Um, a lot of companies, when they adopt uh, AWS, they start with dev test because dev test, if anything goes wrong, is not impacting their public systems. They can secure it, have everything private, it works very well. Or they start with uh, new applications, and rather than having to migrate legacy systems into the cloud, they can take a, uh, a new application and build it for the cloud, which is good. Uh, but rather than trying to migrate everything at once, it's a good idea to just try and take a small thing, get it going, or you even might take one component of an existing application and move it across to the cloud. So. Yeah, corporate pro projects can be more complex. You know, you know all those IT staff you have sitting in that other building who take care of of sysoping and doing all that strange stuff. They're there for a reason in a real uh, IT environment. So when you move to the cloud, don't forget it's important to have that level of control over your environment. Somebody making sure are your security groups correctly configured, are your uh, IAM roles correctly configured. So don't think that the cloud just because one person can do everything. Uh, you should still use the rigor that you still apply in normal corporate settings. Uh, what are you supposed to... Uh, so, I ignored you before, Mr. Bob. I'll answer again. Um, what is the rule for when to comment instead of answering? I wrote an answer to this question, but I think maybe it should have been a comment. Let's see what you said back there. So, my general rule is if you are asking a question back to somebody, then it should be a comment if you if this is an answer that somebody can say yes thank you very much that solved my problem and other people can answer it in the future then uh, oh hello marco thanks for coming across to the, our channel here we are answering aws questions on stack overflow and we will soon do a bit of live coding so hang around for that uh, let's see uh, they asked us they gave some code i hate it when people just give a bit of code and don't answer much of a question ask much of a question try opening the developer tools in your web browser it should let you know if it failed Mr. Bob, um, I, I, that's a fair answer because you're saying to somebody, this is a way you can do it, check the network tab, and that might give you the answer. It's, if you're asking that as a question to say, please tell me what the value is in that particular field and I'll give you a, a further response, then that's probably going to be more of a question. So um, use your judgment. Um, moderators can move answers to comments if people flag them as being incorrect. And if anyone complains, you can always just uh, edit it yourself and do that. Uh, what are we saying here? They will use IAM roles and VPC a lot more. I mean, you can watch reInvent and lots of presentations that will cover best practices. Somebody mentioned reInvent, so I get to mention this page, which I put together uh, in chat. So um, each year after reInvent, I like to go through all the sessions I don't have time to watch all of the videos myself so I make a page that has converted all of the sessions to audio format so you'll see here there are links to YouTube uh, audio and the slideshows and I have even uh, turned it into a podcast link so you can find it in iTunes and popular things like that so um, if you ever have a particular topic such as VPC endpoints uh, evolving VPC design so here is a presentation that could uh, teach you a lot about VPC there's 520 videos here. Don't try and watch them all, but if there are some that meet your particular need, uh, then that's fantastic. Okay, looking for another question, and then we'll go and live code. Uh, Pre-sign URL, slow upload. That's probably the network. 
node. I'm not a node person. Configuration for Amazon Redshift. I do love Redshift. Um, there's a big discussion on there, so I won't add anything further. Catalina. How do I sort SNS alert mails? Switch role for access and policy limits. Uh, there's the one that uh, Mr. Bob answered. Hibernate from local computer EC2 instances to save costs. Thanks for the advice. Definitely going to check it out. Uh, how can I remotely turn on EC2 instances from my computer and turn it off? Uh, I want to use EC2 only while working on my PC and hibernate later on. Does hibernate mean no cost? So um, this is uh, quite appropriate because uh, in a moment I'll be doing some live coding of a stopinator and a stopinator is designed to turn machines off when you don't want to use them. So asking how you can turn them on is quite appropriate. You can certainly uh, make an API call. So if it is your own instance and you are the only person wanting to use it, you can from the command line uh, run a command like this that will turn it on. I also had somebody one time ask, I've got somebody who I've got customers and I want to turn off they've each got a, their own EC2 instance and I want to turn them off when they're not in use but I want the customer to be able to turn it on again and you don't want to give customers credentials to EC2 so how can they invoke a command like this that would turn on a machine and the problem is even a lambda function you've got to have credentials to invoke it so the best answer we came up with was use an API gateway which the customer can hit via a URL the API gateway triggers the Lambda function. The Lambda function effectively runs start instances and turns on the instance. And you could have a, a secret key or something that you pass in that URL that says, I really am this person, please turn on that particular instance. And that way the instance can start up. So I might just add a comment here. It'll take too long for me to find that particular answer. So that's a nice way of doing it there. What's the best option between LightSail and EC2 for a new startup? I'm using my own capital now, but I'm afraid on the cost. So, uh, Rizari, what are you going to be doing on that instance, on the LightSail or EC2? Let's talk about LightSail while you're doing that. Uh, I've recently been involved in creating a few WordPress sites for some uh, organizations. And um, Amazon LightSail is our version of those companies out there that do a lot of website hosting. So you'll go to a company and sometimes you can pay you know, $10, $10 a month. They give you an EC, uh, sorry, they give you a virtual machine. They might load um, a WordPress on it and they'll give you a bit of a control panel where you can start and stop. So it's like a poor man's EC2. And so the AWS equivalent to doing, lights, uh, to doing that is uh, Amazon LightSail, where again, we can give you a low cost instance and you pay a fixed month. And the really interesting thing about LightSail is it includes a certain amount of data transfer. If we have a look at the normal EC2 pricing, uh, let's go for on demand. EC2 pricing is so complex these days, but uh, data transfer should be straightforward. If you are transferring data out of an EC2 instance, and it's going out to the internet, so we're talking within the region, no charge, but Going to a different one, uh, typically you are paying EC2 to the internet. Where's to the internet? Into EC2, out from EC2 to the internet in uh, US regions, for example, is nine cents per gig. So keep that in mind, nine cents per gig. If we come and look at LightSail here, and they've got two gig of, sorry, two terabytes of data transfer. So that would be 2000 times nine cents which would be is that right a hundred and eighty dollars of traffic have i got my maths right so if you can do two terabytes of traffic that would normally cost you a hundred and eighty dollars and that's included 
Only outbound trader transfer. Wow. That's giving you $180 worth of data transfer. I'm right, am I jelly? Wow. So I see a lot of people using LightSail, not because they want a simple solution, but because they want to get access to the lower cost data transfer. You can link LightSail instances to um, VPC. You can't launch them in a VPC, but I believe you can peer them with a VPC or do something funny. So some people do some very strange things just to get the data transfer out here. So uh, maybe you should run a, a, a NAT gateway or a, something on there because that's a really good price you can peer yep so you can peer your uh, light sale instance to your normal vpc and take advantage of this pricing so um, if you've got a single server application uh, you're not doing anything fancy you don't you can do database as well on light sale um, light sale might be a good thing but you can't some things you can't do there was a question the other day somebody wanted to configure which IP addresses are allowed to access their LightSail instance. So only they, they wanted to be the only one who could SSH to their LightSail instance. You don't get normal security groups on LightSail. So you can't say only this particular IP address uh, is available in there. So uh, by all means, um, if LightSail fits your need, go ahead and do it. The other nice thing about LightSail is it comes with a whole lot of um, pre-built AMIs that you can use. So uh, different uh, Linux and Windows operating systems, and you can easily launch a WordPress server. Um, up it goes. So uh, really good for pre-built, just get it up and, and running type stuff. Um, so yeah, instead of using those providers who charge a certain amount per month, you can now uh, boot up LightSail. You can use both LightSail and EC2. Uh, it's a violation of terms to use LightSail to avoid paying EC2 data transfer. So don't abuse that. Ooh. Thank you for pointing that out. Please do not do so. Let's see if we can see EC2 violation light sale data transfer. We have a link to that. Um, light sale FAQs. Free data transfer allowance. If you exceed your data transfer allowance, you'll be charged. It's interesting. It doesn't say on this page that it's bad. So uh, I can't see anything specific. Avoid paying EC2 data transfer. So uh, if you do see anything uh, I would be very interested in knowing if that's true or not, so I can tell people whether they should or shouldn't do it. Can anyone tell me if John has a specific streaming schedule on this stream? So uh, this is the second time I've done this one. If, if you folks enjoy watching it, I will keep doing it. So I do it Sydney, 11 a.m. on Thursdays, which is basically an hour and a quarter ago. So whatever was an hour and a quarter ago on your time when you're watching this, unless you're watching later on YouTube, is when you will be able to um, uh, join me on these streams. So Mr. Bob says, aha, on the service terms, you may not use LightSail in a manner intended to avoid incurring data fees from other services, e.g. proxying services. Fantastic. Okay, folks. So um, please do not, let's get that up. AWS, Amazon.com. Um, talk about Zoom. I'll talk about Chime in a sec too. Yep. Uh, LightSail. 5513. There it is. Thank you very much, Mr. Bob. Wow. So it looks like uh, some people have tried to abuse the system by sending all their traffic through LightSail. LightSail is not intended for that. It is intended as a simple virtual computer for you to be able to get your applications up and going. So don't do any tricky stuff in there. Uh, Chime. So what can I talk about Chime? Uh, and there is Chime. So lots of you these days are probably using uh, chat applications like Slack or, um, well, HipChat was bought out by Slack, um, Microsoft Teams, all of these things. And uh, internal chat applications within companies are very, very popular. And a lot of times people don't want to use things like Slack because the information's outside their company, who knows. So the uh, AWS equivalent is Chime. And... Chime clients. Download the Chime client. We have clients available for uh, Mac, Windows, Web, iOS, and Android. 
Ooh, and an add-in for Outlook. The Outlook add-in allows you to schedule Chime sessions. So Chime is the AWS um, service that allows you to uh, do chatting. It also handles video conferences. I would show you mine, but we use it internally, so I'm just worried about showing you uh, anything that might pop up in Chime. So if you are a company and you want to have an internal chat application, Chime is great because it can link into your um, Active Directory for credentials. Uh, use it for messaging, video calls, audio calls. You can also create rooms. So uh, we have rooms on particular topics. So if uh, board gaming, there's a group of us in the Sydney office who play board games. So we have a, a room where we can just chat about board games and say, who wants to get together today? So uh, very good application. Um, advantages over Zoom. Uh, you can also invite in Chime. You can invite external people to participate in a Chime conversation. Um, but I haven't sat down and compared the details of Zoom versus Chime. Uh, if anyone out there has some more specifics, uh, maybe they can uh, throw some things in there. But uh, yeah, within, within our company, we use Chime for all of our conversations. Uh, I have a friend who's going through an interview process at Amazon. Um, I highly recommend you uh, look at the Amazon job listings and see what we've got available. And um, these days, in the days of COVID, they're doing all the job interviews via Chime. So it's a great way to just hop on and um, communicate with people. Okay. So I think it is time to do some coding. And my coding today is inspired by this question that appeared two days ago. Um, I want to reduce my AWS bill. Uh, the nice thing about AWS, we encourage people to reduce their bill. Uh, turn things off when you're not using them. Use spot instances. Uh, use reserved instances. Um, we Staff in our company don't get rewarded for selling you know, 100,000 sale and then go off and play golf. Uh, we get rewarded uh, by having people gradually increase their use of AWS services. So if you can save money on AWS, you're more likely to use AWS long term. We love that happening. So happy to help you reduce your bill. Uh, Rahul, I'm using some of my instances in my project. I want a notification after a certain period of time when the instance is running and shut down after a certain duration. So they want to notice after th when something's been running for three hours, another notice when it's four hours, and another notice when it's been five hours. And um, a couple of people have suggested things here. You could create a schedule and a cron expression. You can create events in EC2, etc. So um, I thought we'd do a bit of work and try and help this person. Now, officially, Stack Overflow is not a please write some code for me type service. So you shouldn't go on Stack Overflow expecting somebody to write code for you. But I enjoy writing a bit of code. So let's see what we've got here. Um, somebody's saying you can write lots of cron, etc. Uh, here is a bit of code that I wrote in 2016. So it's four years old. And this, it's so old, this is using an earlier version of Boto, which is the, S, the Python SDK for AWS. And I used to teach training classes, and every day I'd launch lots of EC2 instances, and I'd forget to turn them off at the end of the day, and things became quite messy. So what I wanted is something each night to clean things up for me. And what I actually did was I created a whole lot of scripts that I have running on a uh, T2 micro instance all the time to go off and clean up a lot of services for me. So if I go and create an Amazon EC2 key pair, it'll delete the key pair at night. If I create EBS volumes, IAM roles, etc., it will go and clean things up for me each day. And this was the script I wrote to clean up any EC2 instances that I wrote. So this is old Boto, so excuse it for a moment, but it basically says uh, loop through various regions, um, get the instances, and I then had the ability to tag my instances. Is that what this one's doing? Yes. So, uh, okay, I'm setting a default action here, which is, ah, can I share these scripts? The script that I will write in a moment, we will write together. I will put on a GitHub repository and you can all share it and contribute to it. Uh, this one is old and outdated, so I won't do it. But basically what I had was the ability to launch an EC2 instance. Let's uh, give you a quick demo here. Um, and at a certain time of night, I run the script and it turns things off. So here is my EC2 in Sydney. And you can see I've been playing a bit with WordPress. Let's launch an EC2 instance and I'm just going to give it default values. 
and we'll give it a name and I'll just say nothing on this one and I'll launch that EC2 instance and let's launch another EC2 instance the great thing about working for AWS I get to launch EC2 for free as long as I stay within limits I'm going to launch another one and I can add a tag here called cleanup and this one I can say terminate I'll explain why I'm doing this in a moment so this one has a tag called cleanup terminate I go and launch it we will create something better ourselves so what this script is doing when it when it runs um, on a cron schedule at night it says default action is stop if cleanup is mentioned in the tags then extract the action from that tag so it looks at the tag that was on that EC2 instance gets an action and if the action is ignore or the instance is already terminated skip over it don't do anything if it was marked as terminate then call terminate if it was marked as stop and the instance is not already stopped then stop the instance and the reason I came up with this method is that I wanted to delete the instances at night that I'd run during the day so everything is fresh for the next day but I didn't oh, what language is this this is Python uh, I didn't want to turn off the instances that I normally keep running during the day so I normally have a, a this instance here called ops and a, a Windows instance iPhone have running I don't want it to, to stop them so in my tags I can add a tag here that says cleanup ignore so it tells my cleanup script ignore this machine just skip over it uh, however what I've done with the tagged instance as we saw before I've marked it as cleanup terminate and the one that I have not tagged is, does not have a cleanup tag so let's see what happens when that particular script is called and we'll make a better version of this in a moment this script goes off through every region at every instance and figures out what to do the default is it will stop the instance if it's been marked as terminate it will terminate the instance so what's happened it has found my instance called nothing which did not have a tag so it has stopped that instance let's have a look my nothing instance is now stopped and the one that was marked as clean up terminate we have a look at this one here has been terminated so at the end of the day it can um, stop things to stop me paying for things or if I just want to launch a temporary one it can terminate so let's use that as a bit of an example and build something ourselves and I sort of see three different types of stopinators you might want to write and I've sort of categorized them here um, the script that I just did is a sort of run once per day so you might want to say hey at six o'clock seven o'clock each night I want to run a script just to turn off machines that aren't necessary uh, a more involved one might be hey not only do I want to turn off something but I want to turn it on in the morning and you could run a stop a start script and you could run a stop script but what if we put tags on the instances and you could say for each individual instance when you want to be started and when you want to be stopped so that'd be a nice thing to build in you could also build in that notification that Rahul wanted on that uh, stack overflow question uh, which is here he wants to say after a certain duration of the instance running I want to stop it uh, how do you, you you guys can keep chatting in chat I'll go on with this thing so um, let's try and convert that simple stopinator that once in day stopinator to turn it into a lambda function uh, oops I misspelled lambda lambda I have all these shortcuts where I can jump straight to console sessions let's go and launch a few more EC2 instances just so we can uh, do some testing here a name tag of um, no tag fantastic are they good plugins for VS Code uh, I use lots of plugins in VS Code for uh, JSON formatting I think there's even a cloud formation linter out there that somebody has written so if you like using uh, Visual Studio Code by all means go out there and oh they changed the icon change the icon Let's see if there's any AWS plugins available AWS toolkit 
um, sorry, it's chopped off the top of the screen there. So the AWS toolkit, it looks like the official AWS toolkit that we provide. CLI, code deploy. So uh, yeah, it looks like people have written quite a few pl uh, plugins, not all of which are official. Make my window down a bit. Okay, back to Lambda. Let's create a function. Oh, thanks, Jelly. Uh, let's call this uh, stopinator1. I like to program in Python. Lots of different programming languages available for use with Lambda. If a programming language you like is not available here, you can create your own custom runtime that allows you to load your particular language. So Go, for example, nope, Go is now an officially supported one. Uh, C, if you want to program in C, you could load it in by the custom runtime. We'll just give it access to a role. Roles are something you need to think about after creating a function as well. What's my opinion of the SAM CLI? I, I haven't used SAM much, but um, a lot of people who say if you're starting to write serverless functions, start going with SAM. It's a good way to deploy and keep track of your code. I tend to write little Lambda functions, so I just do it directly in Lambda. Is R supported in Lambda? Not directly, but uh, if you can build a Lambda layer for it, um, you can probably get that going. Do a web search. You never know what you'll find out there. So uh, what do we want to do in this function? So we want to terminate. Let's um, let's say we start by um, doing what I did in that other one. Now I look for a tag, and if that tag has an action, then we'd perform that action. If there is no tag, we want to stop the instances. The first question is: Do we want to do this for all regions or not? Um, so you can call, make a call out three C two. To get a list of regions. Does AWS run on Linux? AWS runs on many different things. Uh, underneath we use a lot of, of uh, Linux services but not everything can run on Linux. For example we also make uh, Windows services available on AWS so that would have to run on the Windows operating system but uh, Linux would be the more popular choice for a lot of uh, implementations. So regions. How can we get a list of regions? Describe regions, fantastic. So if you want to uh, loop through a whole lot of regions, you can call regions. Now, the important thing about this is whether it returns all of the regions that are active in your account or not. Oops. Describe regions. So describe all the ones that are enabled for your account. So in the old days, you used to get every region added to your account, but more recently, um, new regions are not turned on by default in your AWS accounts. You've got to specifically ask for them to be enabled, which is handy because you don't want people accidentally creating things in the wrong region. So I'm going to, um, oh, let's do it. We'll use the uh, describe regions capability. Let's get a client EC2. Client. Let's go to three client for EC2. Let's import Boto3. And what does it return? Always consult the documentation. And it returns a list of regions. And we want, I presume, is my Lambda function going to be more available if I put it service on a pod inside of Kubernetes? I'm not, so Kubernetes is sort of an alternative to a Lambda option. If you want to use Kubernetes, well, no, it's more of an alternative to containers. Any Kubernetes experts want to comment out there? Uh, so let's call a response. I like naming my clients specifically if it's EC2 or S3. That's a good way of not getting mixed up with two different clients out there. Describe regions. Uh, sometimes I get lazy and I just like to put a print in there and see what happens when I run a function. With Lambda you can go in and you can create a test event. In this case I'm not passing any particular values in so I don't need to configure my test event. 
that I can just go up here and say test. Another popular way of doing uh, Lambda programming, some people like writing it locally on their own machine, maybe just in, in normal Python, and then seeing and then converting it across. So up here, I can see the output. I've got a regions thing, and I'm interested in getting the region name to my particular region. Fantastic. So I can say for region in response regions uh, okay I'm now going to create a new EC2 client actually okay I'll overwrite my EC2 client And I can come in here and say region name equals region region name, which should hopefully do it. So what's happening here is I'm looping through every region, but I'm you might have experienced writing unit tests for lambdas. The great thing about unit tests for lambdas is you can either use the pre-built events up here, or you can just write code that, that call a lambda, um, passing it a certain payload that's in there. Are lambdas guaranteed to run? Are they high availability? Uh, lambda concurrency. There's some very interesting information out there about scaling and concurrency on Lambda. And by default, you have the ability to run a thousand concurrent, uh, oops, thousands, a thousand concurrent executions of Lambda functions. So if you're running more than that, they won't get run immediately, they will queue up. And this documentation page explains um, how that is handled and what happens if you hit the limits, as does this page here, which is scaling. I should put links to that in the chat. And this explains, um, oh, they are, we've got burst concurrency limits. We do let you go a little bit over those limits these days as well, uh, which is very handy. So. Lambda functions will run unless you don't have enough concurrency or capacity available within there. Oops, the wrong thing there. Um, Everything going okay out there? WS land, hopefully. My window just went funny. Uh, okay, back to the code here. I'm just calling up my chat window again. Okay, what do we got here? We've got a, uh, we're looping through each of the regions. We can then call EC2 client describe. Region, no, describe instances. I never program without looking at the documentation. Describe instances. Oh, Lambda functions in Cloud9. So actually the editor that you have in the Lambda interface is actually a cut down version of Cloud9. When um, we implemented Cloud9 in our systems, this was the first one to get the Cloud9 type functionality. So it's effectively uh, built in there for you. Let's get the instances. Uh, do we have to say anything? I don't need to filter anything in here. Fantastic. I'm going to assume there's less than a thousand instances. Uh, instances equals. Okay, so I'm now getting instances and for instance in instances, what does the response come through as? Now, when you're programming in Python with Boto, there's two ways of using things. You can use client functions and you can use resource functions. And 
the client methods what I'm, I'm using at the moment and they come back as very raw things and you've got to scrape the answers out of this um, sort of um, JSON type object. If you use resources, you can use very Pythonic syntax to go through. Uh, it's your choice of which particular ones you want to use. So uh, describe instances comes back with something called reservations. When you launch an EC2 instance, you can actually launch multiple instances together and that's called a reservation. So within reservations, there's instances. So for reservation in reservations, for instance in reservation instances, which will be this one here. And I always like to debug as I go, print instance, and let's just print the instance ID. And we'll also print the region that we're doing here. The region is region. Save it and test it. So what I should be doing here is it should be looping through every region, which might give some errors. Um, oh, it took longer than three seconds because looping through every region takes longer by default. Lambda functions are set to three seconds. Let's increase that. It's amazing how many Stack Overflow questions people say, my function didn't run. It's because you've got to increase the timeout. Now it's a little bit slow here to loop through every region. So it's up to you. You might want to reconfigure this um, uh, function to only go to one particular region that you're working in. Let's see if this runs. I've also had trouble in the past sometimes when it tried to access regions like um, the China regions that I didn't have access to. So looks like it has come back and has reported that in the Sydney region, AP Southeast 2, I have a whole lot of instances. So the code seems to be working so far. Um, I will actually cheat and make this run a little bit faster in future. I will just say, please default to AP Southeast to run a bit faster. Okay, what do we want to do with this instance? So if I look back to my old fashioned code that I used to have for the original Boto, um, I looped through the reservations, I looped through the instances, and I wanted to get the tag from that particular instance and base an action on that. So let's see how I can do that here. Get instance um, cleanup tag. So I come here to describe instances. We go down to the tag section and I'm given a dictionary of tags. I did that in the old days. I said, oh, okay, I can reference it that way. So the tags dictionary and I can get the tag called cleanup. I first of all said if it's in the keys, I'm going to steal some of my old code. Uh, you only want to reference a tag if a tag exists. So if cleanup exists in uh, instance tags, if the keys of that thing include a cleanup tag, then I want to extract an action, which is the instance tags. Clean up, will that work? That will give me the instance tags key. Let's clean up. So go to the tags, get the clean up tag, convert it to lowercase because I want to do fancy things. That might work. And let's try that. Uh, it's more efficient to do multi threading. Yeah, if you're fancy and you can figure out how to do multi-threading with this stuff, uh, go ahead and do it. But you're right, if I'm going through lots of regions doing all at once, you might want to do it. Frankly, a stopinator, I don't care if it takes a minute longer to do things. Okay. Uh, I'll print the action to see if I got the correct action. Give that a test. So the idea here is I'm trying to pull out uh, a tag that is telling me what to do on that particular instance, and I will base it accordingly. Help me with some programming here for regions. I stuffed it up with my region in regions because it lost the semicolon. Region in regions, semicolon, save, test. 
you know, a lot of people are scared of Lambda and just sit down and start writing things. It's not too hard. It's now going mad at indices. Uh, it's pulling out the bad region name because I'm referencing it again. So it was my code fault. Since I'm setting region equal to the current region, it would actually be using region there other than something else. More debugging problems. No, I just didn't change it. Uh, here is region name. Ah, it's not the region, it's the region. It is the region name. So I'm getting my EC2 client, getting my region. So what does my region look like? Even the experts have problems. Yeah, it's just standard coding. Uh, you're the ones watching me code. That's the funny thing. You can all sit back and have a beer while I'm watching. Uh, print region. Let's go get the right field out. Oh, I tell you what it is. It's because I cheated. Because I cheated. And I'm not passing back the same object. So I am going to... I'm going to undo my cheats and get it to do the official thing and that way it won't go mad at me because I tried to shortcut and just run for run region. Yeah, thanks Mr. Bob, I think that was the problem. So the problem is now it's slow, but <laughs> it will work. And okay. No keys, line 18, if cleanup in tags, no attribute keys. Okay. That's what happens when you steal code from a previous program without trying it first. So I have my tags. Because it's not an object, it's because it's in that. So. How can I pull out a tag, but only if I know that that tag exists um, without causing a problem? I might have to do a try catch. Tags might not be defined if there are no tags. It's also because it's not really. Oh, it is coming back with a dictionary. Clean up in tags, tags, keys. Let's see. Print. Use get and set a default. Oh, I like that one. I like that one. So action equals uh, instance tags. And hopefully there is a tags thing. Clean up. Will that work first of all? I definitely want to go back to this cheating for a moment though. Um, let's see, it's a list of dictionaries. It is a list of dictionaries. See, I should have tried this beforehand. Um, so tags is a list, within the list. Tags is a list. Within the list, there is that one. So I want to get that particular tag out. You know, you uh, EC scribe instances extract tag for Stack Overflow. Let's see if someone in Stack Overflow has managed to do it for us. Ah, but this has got to be using Boto. This is why it exists, isn't it? Uh, give me a filter. No, that's filtering on a particular tag. That is close. Need to loop to find the tag. I'll, uh, I might skip that for the moment and come back to it then. Uh, okay, so what we could do, I like the, the looping thing. Let's give that a go. So, for tag in instance tags, 
this isn't even the hard bit. Uh, if uh, tag key is equal to cleanup then action equals tag value. How's that? That's easier than anything. Let's set a default action. And give that a run. I love it. Pair programming for the win. Now that is still going to loop through every region, but it's going to get quite slow and annoying for me. So and cheat and say response equals regions. Region name peace southeast. That might work. I'm giving it a fake dictionary so we can go things faster. Okay, name tags is not defined. Line twenty one. Tag and that tag tags plural. Oh, okay. Action equals tags singular. This time for sure. Should go faster. Only testing one. Now that was very fast. Must be integers. Line eleven. I stuffed up the region name thing again, and I can. Yeah, every time I try and make things faster, I end up making them slower. So I will let it ride. This gives us more time to chat. So let's recap here. I am trying to extract the action from the tag, and based on the tag, I will either stop the instance, ignore the instance, or terminate the instance. Looping through all the regions, and it has given me a result of be printing the actions associated. I have a null and what happened to my other print statement that I had with the instances? It has not found the instances. I am dying terribly here. Print region. Region name. If in doubt, add more debug code. I thought I should have uh, practiced this beforehand and brought in my live code that I tested earlier. Uh, whatever I do get through and further, I will upload into a GitHub repository so people can make use of this. And my intention is to make a few intelligent uh, stopinators. This one is just the once a day. Uh, later on, we'll improve and have start and stop times in there as well. So let's see what's going on. Everything is dying. What I will do is I will go off and not waste any more time with this. It's the null is the return value of the function. Oh, okay then. But why isn't it getting my print statements? I'm getting it to describe regions for region in regions, response regions. Uh, not the print content. Oh, you're right. Things are working. Oh, 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 they're working. I just didn't wait long enough. Okay. Loops through each of the regions. I was about to give up. It's looping through each of the regions. And fantastic. It's saying for this instance, there's a tag that says stop. There's a tag that says ignore. There's a tag that says stop, etc. So that's uh, excellent. Phew. Let's continue. So I now have an action. I have a default action of stop, which is why so many of those instances came up and said the default is to stop them if you don't know what's going on. And uh, we can now uh, take an action. So um, uh, if action is equal to ignore, then I don't want to do anything to this particular instance and I want to continue my loop basically say, uh, ignore this thing. Um, if I want to stop an instance, if action is equal to stop, um, 
then oh and the instance i remember in my old code i had this clever thing in here that said and the instant state is not stopped i'll we'll have to translate that into boto3 terminology and the instance state is not equal to stopped then we want to call ec2 client plus my Berto documentation we'll say stop instances and I think it's instance IDs plural I think is given as a list and that will be instance instance ID give my syntax in a moment and I should be using if else's but who knows terminate if action is equal to terminate and what was my logic before uh, no it was just terminate oh this is cute I said it can be shorthand t or terminate if I'm too lazy to, uh, to be typing um, then copy this thing paste it in there terminate instances come for the syntax uh, here's a bit of history for you um, if uh, why when you start an instance in EC2 why do we call it run instances and not launch instances you'll notice there's run start stop and terminate so run and terminate sort of appears and start and stop appears and the answer if you know the history of ec2 is that in the early days of ec2 you couldn't stop an instance there was no amazon ebs they only had ephemeral disks so if you were to stop an instance you would lose the content of the disk and so it was not possible to stop an instance so you could only run an instance which means launch it or you could terminate an instance later on when amazon ebs came as um a permanent disk storage we added the ability to start an instance and stop an instance so hence the funny terminology of run instances it's always unclear whether that means launch or start so terminate instances yep instance ids equals that thing fantastic and also stop instances syntax is the same thing so theoretically that should work uh, let's add some thing in here uh, stopping instance uh, instance instance ID fantastic and terminating now the one dangerous thing about running this sort of code on your your account is it might accidentally go off and kill important instances that you have out there so one thing I've made sure is that my important instances like uh, this ops instance I have um, is protected with a thing called termination protection so i have termination protection enabled so my, my script could stop the instance but it won't accidentally terminate the instance if, if anything goes wrong let's have a look whether this ran i tell you what i might whack the time up a little bit it came back with that null again i don't know why it came back with a null Give it another try. Lots of database discussions. Yep, plenty of databases out there. It can be very confusing knowing which database service to use on AWS because each has a particular thing. Uh, RDS is great for relational database, typical SQL. DynamoDB is good for no SQL. Uh, ElastiCache is a, a caching service for temporary storing things. Neptune is a uh, graph type database redshift petabyte scale data warehouse quantum ledger database if you need to prove that uh, some data was stored in the database people can't um, remove the audit trail history document db is based on mongo key spaces is based on cassandra so uh, lots of database choices out there and ah oh, thank you my null is up the top that's the return value thank you somebody said that before so i'm looping through and it said I'm stopping a number of instances and I'm terminating an instance let's go to my EC2 this is beforehand I haven't refreshed the screen yet notice that we had now oh, let's do a refresh 
Uh, I launched an instance here with no tag. It's hard to remember which ones I launched in what order. No tag has been stopped. And the tagged one has been terminated. What was the tag? The cleanup tag was there. So it is actually working. Uh, let's do one final test. I will go to another region. Let's go to Oregon. Nothing like a real life test. Now let's launch another instance. And we'll try one of lots of different types. Uh, let's give this one a name and uh, no tag. So the next thing I want to try is one that, so that should be stopped automatically. If I want to launch another one, I can say, by the way, that launch another instance feature is fantastic. You can just copy all the settings. This one is going to be a, a stop one, clean up, stop. And let's take a copy of that one, launch more like this. Let's do another tag. Uh, this one will be a terminate tag. Let's launch that. And I think we're all set. So we now have three instances, one with no tag that should be stopped, one that says stop. Oh no, there's another one I want, which is an ignore tag. Clean up, ignore. A bit of a discussion there about the AWS free tier I see in the chat. Uh, yes, a couple of things worth mentioning about the free tier is there are some things that are only available for the first 12 months. Uh, for example, you'll see here that says 12 months free and you can search for it here. So um, some services are only free for the first month, for 12 months. There's also something here which says uh, always free. For example, every month you will get your first 100, uh, 1 million Lambda requests per month for free plus a certain number of seconds per month, etc. So um, just make sure that uh, you understand the difference between some of them. Uh, some of them are only free in the first 12 months of your account. Some of them are free every month. Is there an easy way to see how much things will cost after the first 12 months? There's all of the uh, pricing pages that you'll be able to see there. Uh, okay, let's give this Lambda a spin and it's now going to work in a different region. Um, I started calculating one time what the free tier actually gives to you. And a lot of people say, oh, I'm really worried. I'm about to exceed my free tier usage and I don't want to go too far. And if you look in services, for example, uh, S3 gives you five gig of standard storage and a certain number of requests. What is five gig of storage worth in S3? If you go to the S3 pricing pages, uh, the storage, I think we saw... Uh, there was data transfer before we saw before. Standard storage means your objects are kept in three physical data centers. Uh, you are paying, wow, that's so low cost, uh, around about two cents per gig. So if in the free tier we give you five gig free during the month, that means we give you a whole 11 cents of free S3 usage. So sometimes even if you exceed the free usage tier, it's not going to cost you that much money. Uh, same thing for EC2, it doesn't add up uh, to too much in there. Let's go back to my stopinator. Uh, it looks like it had a ignored. There was a stop and it stopped the instance. There was a stop that stopped it. Who knows? Terminate, terminate. Let's go to the console and have a look at the result. And the answer is the thing that didn't have a tag was told to stop. The one that was said to ignore is still running. The stop was stopped and the terminate was terminated. So uh, that code is working okay. I will clean it up for future use, but just as a reference, um, oops, it doesn't fit in there. I will add it to my page. The, uh, the link that you've got here, the bit.ly link goes to this page and I will shove the code in there for you. 
Um, quick stopinator. Does stopinator have two Ps? I never know what to do there. So if you go to that bit.ly link, you should find the code that we just wrote uh, down the bottom there. I will clean it up and probably go further in our future weeks and try and get some uh, better stopinators out there that can do things like uh, uh, what do we have here. Um, stop after a certain duration and configure individual start and stop times. And I'll do it so I don't get trapped trying to figure out how to pull a tag out of something. So um, that's hitting about two hours here. So I'm going to end the stream. Um, I do want to say thank you very much for uh, joining me and um, participating in, in a bit of Stack Overflow, a bit of coding there. Uh, if you enjoyed it, uh, drop me a note through my Twitter handle that's uh, shown on the screen there. John Rotenstein is my name. Or uh, if you look at my profile on Stack Overflow, you should find my email address in there as well. And thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to doing more. Thanks, Jelly. I'll, I'll happily continue this. Um, starting up in June again, we will be having the, um, let me get this right, um, CQ YouTube. I do, and well, I'm involved in another stream called the, what I want, what my playlist, uh, the AWS certification quiz show. And I write the questions for this quiz show. Uh, if you look for CQ, AWS CQ on um, YouTube, you'll find all of our back episodes. And this is a series where we um, pose typical uh, questions for an exam. I write them so they're not as good as the exam questions. And you can try and beat uh, the expert on the show who is trying to answer the exam questions as well. So you can and try and do that. And um, uh, you'll find me doing various other shows on the stream as well. But uh, thank you very much for joining along. Uh, as I said, you'll find my email address in my Stack Overflow profile if you're smart enough to find it or reach me on the uh, Twitter link there. So thank you very much. I'll see you again in next week, minus two hours, uh, and join you in. Thanks very much, thanks. And thanks, Vinod and Arkanot Kakapoopy. What sort of username is that? Thanks very much. See you all next time. Cheers.